Uh, my name is Beatrice. Uh, I'm the new uh, UK regional coordinator for ILB. Uh, Emma is also here. Um, she's also looking after ILB in the UK. Um, we want to thank uh, 3LR and ETC, Kat and Sean, who are present uh, today for sponsoring the event and the, the series of events that we organize. Today we are at the second appointment um, of these uh, tricks and tips uh, of architecture of uh, theater lighting, reimagined for architectural lighting designers. And uh, our second speaker is Anna Sboku. She is member of ILD. Uh, she is founder of AS Light, uh, based in London and uh, Athens, where she is uh, at the moment. And um, she recently won this amazing award of emerging practice uh, at the um, Lighting Design Award, among with other awards that we all know uh, she won. Uh, she will talk about similarities and differences between theater lighting and architectural lighting design, and how we can borrow from um, theater lighting to create more engaging and uh, um, immersive uh, lighting settings in, uh, in our um, profession. So yeah, I give the, the word to Anna. Um, and yeah, we, we are looking forward to see your presentation. <laughs> OK, so let's get started. And we're following up. So this is round two. I don't know um, how many of the participants uh, attended Alvis's talk a week ago. So uh, for those who haven't, this is uh, kind of a three-part uh, session. So this is the middle uh, part that relates more to uh, the situation of uh, today, as we know it, both in uh, theater and architecture, and how the two are linked and have been linked and potentially will be linked uh, in the future as well. So just to get started with the common ground, because before we start with the differences, um, this is the definition of stage lighting, right? So according to lovely Wikipedia, which we, for some reason, trust, um, lighting for stage involves manipulating the four major controllable qualities of light, intensity, color, direction, and movement, in order to influence the four functions for stage lighting, which are mood, selective focus, modeling, and visibility. So you see that this basic rule of stage lighting, um, in theory, uh, applies in architectural lighting as well, right? Um, it'd be interesting to notice that visibility in the um, aims of stage lighting comes last. So what in architectural lighting would be the primary concern, clarity, for example. In theater lighting, it's it's not last, it's not, it's definitely not the first. So mood and selective focus or the feeling and the aesthetics and the visual uh, outcome is of primary concern. But theater and architecture have, they, they start on a different uh, kind of, on a base of differences. So the, the role of theater is to excite, entertain, transform and transfer. On the other hand, the role of architecture uh, historically, at least, because this has, uh, is starting to change, is to accommodate, to structure, to be omnipresent, and to aspire. So they set out to do two very different things, right? And so does the lighting to accommodate um, either environment. So they're not exactly, they don't really have a common ground, though they could have um, common principles and common strategies. Some differences that Alkisti also identified in a previous uh, talk is the short duration, right? So theater is predominantly, I mean, for some a bit more sadistic uh, theater companies, it might last four to five hours, but in average, it's a, an hour and a half to a two hour uh, performance. Architecture, on the other hand, can vary in duration. It can actually go up to 12 hours, right? So it varies depending on the purpose uh, of the space. In theater, we have audience, and it's a very specific relationship between um, what's happening on stage and what's happening in the audience. While in architecture, we have visitors, and visitors that tend to free roam around, which is not necessarily the easiest thing for lighting to accommodate. 
So while one condition have a very specific uh, and set viewing point and um, relationship to uh, what is being displayed, in the other hand, with architecture, uh, it's all it's quite an immersive and organic and personal experience what it is that you will uh, actually see. The most important difference for me, though, is uh, of a psychological nature is when you are when you find yourself in theater, it doesn't really happen by accident, right? So you have the element of intention, which means that you've already made a decision to put yourself in that environment, in that process, in that situation, and you're far more open and, and ready to receive whatever that is that you're about to uh, witness and experience. Architecture, on the other hand, is predominantly experienced by me. This is starting to change lately now that architecture is starting to have a visual and an aesthetic design interest as well. So somebody would actually travel to the city to uh, see and visit architecture, but this is not the majority of, of the use of the spaces that we have today. So theater lighting design has been pretty much doing this, right, to one level or another. Uh, its primary concern is the visual, the, the aesthetics. It's to drive you in to a different world, is to create an illusion. It's, they're, they're the masters uh, of illusion. So you place yourself in a position that you're transferred into another world, or so we would hope. Techniques have changed and technologies have changed, obviously, and they've been developed and adapted and so on. But the aim, the primary goal of the existence of theater lighting hasn't really changed. It's always been to um, the wow factor, as, as we call it, right? Something that will attract your attention, that will take you out of your uh, present and uh, transfer you into an, another world. And it's stimulating and it's engaging and it can be thought provoking as well and mood provoking and so on. Architectural has gone through quite a different trajectory, right? In its infancy, which is obviously a lot later than uh, theater lighting design as an established um, discipline. It started by trying to uh, address the problem, uh, tackle the function, make sure that it's, you know, uh, technically accurate and it's correct rather than beautiful or enticing. So we've ended up for quite a few decades with schemes that although they could be technically impeccable and very smooth and very soft, it always kind of leaves you wanting something more, right? They um, either end up very flat or uninteresting despite their uh, level of uh, competency and accuracy that you know, the designer might have. Lately, and meaning the last uh, a couple of decades, this is starting to change uh, dramatically and to everybody's excitement from the discipline, I guess. Um, a lot more drama is being introduced. Uh, a lot more interesting and visual elements uh, are being taken into account. We are starting to care uh, a lot more about the aesthetics of it all and the feeling of the space. So making the experience far more immersive rather than just that of an audience from a distance. This has given us the opportunity to do um, many things along with the technology that has been developed over the years and along with the socio-cultural kind of development uh, of how lighting in the urban environment is actually uh, addressed. But how did we actually get here, right? In order to get to that point, we borrowed, we as architectural lighting designers have borrowed a few uh, tricks and tips as uh, Emma was calling them as well from, from theater. And the three main ones that I would like to put forward um, is the most important one, shaping light. Right. This is something that um, in older kind of the years, it wasn't that easy to actually fully control to the level of accuracy that we can do it today, uh, a beam of a light. This is something that theaters and theater lighting designers are the actual masters of. This is the basis of, of what we do in theater. And there are various ways of doing so, right? So all of these aspects have now been 
uh, redeveloped or, or adjusted to suit the scale of architecture, which is vastly different than the one of theater. And these elements, just to go through them one by one, we have uh, shutters, which is effectively framing uh, a beam into a specific geometrical shape. We have uh, barn doors, which are not so uh, present in architectural lighting, but you can still find them in some tracks, for, for example. And effectively what they do, they still frame in a way, but in a much softer way. So it's more containing the spill of the light rather than shaping uh, it's, it's the beam itself. We have gobos, which we all, all, I think, kind of are familiar with them by now, from the tackiest to the prettiest. There is a wide range of them uh, to looking for Batman every now and then. Um, and then we have uh, Zoom, which has to do with uh, resizing more than anything. Now, in, in theater uh, lighting equipment, Zoom also does this little fantastic thing. I'm not sure whether in this image is um, quite uh, noticeable. You can net or flew, if I'm using the right expressions, um, your, your beam. So regardless of your beam angle, which you can set with the zoom, you can also decide how sharp or how frosted and soft your edges of your beam are. This is something that hasn't fully transferred in architectural lighting equipment. When we get a zoom profile, for example, for um, a track spot, you can control the beam angle, but not necessarily the softening of the edges. This is fixed to each uh, of the beams kind of preset. And then we have my personal favorite, which is lenses. Now in, in theater lighting design, the equipment is obviously of a much larger scale, right? Uh, and so are the sources uh, in a sense, but because of the, the size of the housing, it has always been quite easy or easier to redirect and control uh, the beam through lenses rather than uh, reflectors or the use of both, or the use of both, right? So uh, in theater lighting design has developed the majority of the lenses that we're using today, a softening lens, a spread lens, um, various others, uh, and because there are variations of frost and there are variations of spreads and so on and so forth. Now this is, you can obviously find in a much different scale and size, um, fully available uh, these days in, in architectural lighting and quite nicely used. So it has quite a few very interesting applications. Just to see uh, a few as an example. So for example, we have the first image at the top. It's using what is uh, predominantly in architecture, one of the most um, kind of famous, let's say, uh, theater um, light pictures, which is um, a profile. And this is a, a source for mini, for example, which is ETC, given the fact that we have you tonight, I'll do a little tribute, um, that develops basically the source for, which is quite a large um, picture, into uh, a mini version. I think it was originally done for galleries and museums. So, but it, we kept the full flexibility. So both the shutters, gel frames, zooms, the change of lenses, the, the netting, the softening or um, sharpening the, the edges and so on. So what we've done here is effectively uh, frame each of the steps of the staircase. And this is a showroom. So it's a, you know, a predominantly architectural space. And it was very interesting to see the use of, of um, a theater technique into an architectural space that it, A, it worked because in architectural lighting, it still remains a factor. People need to be able to go up the staircase safely, no matter how aesthetically interesting we want to become, we still need to comply with certain uh, needs and rules. But it generated an additional interest that um, was treating the staircase as a free floating object, which was the original intention of the architecture itself. Moving to the um, uh, image on the right, this is uh, the entrance of a restaurant. We had the lovely tree uh, right in front of the signage. So when we started lighting the tree, uh, we got the double leaf effect naturally uh, onto that wall, which we quite like. But then we realized that that tree will be long gone and being half the size by the time kind of winter kicked in. So we added a profile with the gobo of the dappled leaf effect 
to mix with the natural and kind of maintain the effect throughout the year. Um, another example is an exhibition at the bottom left where thread lenses on a narrow beam spot were used just as a visual highlight, just to split a fairly large board um, with uh, informational material about the exhibition, just to add it a bit of a visual interest. And then the one at the bottom on the right, you can see maybe the fixture on the track actually has barn doors. So what was um, wanted, well, the fixtures at the back are have shutters. So it's quite a sharp uh, framing of that white beam onto the white canvas. For the table, because it was a table, a meeting room table, we wanted something a little bit softer and that's where the barn doors uh, came quite handy. These were all little tricks that we could pull out of the theater lighting toolkit and use them in architectural spaces and were actually very helpful to do what we call the fine tuning of all of these uh, ideas. The second principle that uh, architectural lighting has uh, borrowed uh, quite heavily actually from theater uh, has to do with mood setting. And this is a very welcome uh, addition to the toolkit of architectural lighting design because it's uh, actually quite important. So by using scenes and scenarios, uh, color mixing, whether it's tunable white or actual RGBs or RGBWs, um, getting dimming to a really low level, because I think we all missed it when tungsten and halogen and incandescent went away. And up until LEDs will, could actually reach again uh, that level of uh, smooth dimming and low levels. You get transitions, which has to do with time, which is a very, very important part that in theater lighting is fundamental. And we actually count time in seconds, also called beats. And five seconds versus six seconds can make a very big difference on stage. Now, obviously, this is the scale that in architectural lighting design doesn't really transfer to that level of detail. But a very smooth transition from one scene to the other can also be uh, something very important that can either make or break the mood you're trying to set uh, for that space. And full controls is something quite important. Um, I, I'm always baffled, and I still haven't kind of figured that one out. Why did we reinvent the wheel with DALI while we already had DMX? This is kind of my own personal uh, question. But effectively, in theater lighting, we could do individual addresses, really low dimming, fast responses as well. So it was full control, obviously in large scale of equipment, right? So a lighting console, for example, is could be the size of a table. Could also be something smaller these days, but predominantly it's a full on professional desk is quite a large item. Um, this in architectural lighting, thankfully, has transferred into quite compact devices, be it a tablet or even your phone these days, everything wireless, you can uh, be controlling and setting the scenes and triggering scenes um, and dimming the lights from your phone. And we are using uh, color hmm, sometimes better than others. <laughs> While in theater, there's allowance for color because of the shortness of time, right? There is uh, time matters on the exposure of uh, a scene, be it dramatic or uh, openly lit or colorful or uh, vastly and quickly changing. You can do anything you want for a short period of time. As soon as that time is prolonged, a lot of caution needs to be taken into um, account. So this is something that we're not really gonna learn from theater because we don't really care about that aspect in theater lighting because we have the luxury of a short period of time. So there's a lot of allowance within that short period. Transferring that into some uh, quick examples in architecture, just the use of color and, and drama. This was a lobby of the hotel that has um, a video artist do an installation in the ceiling, which was filmed from the inside of the seat. So effectively, you would be sitting on the sofas, looking up as if you were looking from the inside uh, of the seat uh, out to the surface. Uh, very simple use of colors. And it was very simple and dramatic, I think, because of the theater background. <laughs> so uh, the whole less is more uh, approach. Um, it's, it's a lot easier. I, I've come to find, I might be wrong, but this is my um, um, understanding. Theater lighting designers are a lot 
uh, quicker and easier to get rid of things and change their minds because you have the luxury of that adaptability in the theater space with uh, the rig uh, in versus architectural lighting designers that we sometimes get stuck with one idea and don't realize that it's not necessarily the right one uh, for that application. The example on the right is uh, the Santa Marina tunnel of the hotel in Mykonos, which was a very simple lighting uh, kind of design in a sense. All of its uh, trickiness had to do with the, the right color temperature at the right moment with the right length of a transition in between. So in this case, we ended up with 40 and 45 minute long transitions so that it's seamless and you barely understand it and we're actually following blue hours, both sunset and, and sunrise. Apart from that, the rest of the lighting is fairly straightforward. There was nothing that, um, Kind of fascinating, let's say, about it, dare I say. So the third thing that um, architectural lighting design has borrowed or stolen, it's not clear, from theater lighting is people. Uh, there has been the last uh, couple of decades uh, a quite an impressive influx of uh, theater lighting designers moving into architectural lighting, which makes sense, um, makes financial sense, probably makes um, Stability sense it's a very different schedule uh, and lifestyle to be a theater lighting designer than to be an architectural lighting designer. And also, I think it might have uh, something to do with the fact that for quite a few years at the beginning of architectural lighting design, there was no school for it, there was no education, there was no program for it. So it made perfect sense that people that are very much familiar with lighting, which are theater lighting designers, would be the right candidates to move into architectural lighting design. So they moved from, yeah, a, a black box and spending kind of days before you see daylight into days that you see daylight, but you barely kind of lift your head or move around. And I'm exaggerating, of course. Um, we, there's, there's also, and, and I'm, I was always kind of a big fan of that, um, sector of lighting design. There's exhibition lighting, which uh, always seem to be borrowing from everyone with no guilt whatsoever, right? So uh, and because for exhibitions and museums, be it permanent or temporary, there was always uh, a base understanding that the most important goal of an exhibition is the object and the wow factor, because they're uh, asking visitors to join in or pay and join in predominantly. So on that basis and, and level of understanding of what's important about the visual result, there was a lot of accommodation, not necessarily allowance because exhibition lighting has restrictions as well, both architectural and um, content related like conservation and so on. But it had a lot of liberty and, and understanding as to the importance of doing something more, the added value to doing a second layer of the system and then um, kind of playing with the balance in between or having a slightly interactive corner that adds a little bit of dynamic aspect to the trajectory and the journey uh, of an exhibition. So in exhibition lighting, they've effectively kept the rig from uh, theater, but in a much smaller scale, but the flexibility of moving things around on the spot uh, is present to the majority of um, gallery spaces, especially when they're housing temporary uh, exhibitions. They, the use of color is uh, both on actual pigment color and light color um, is quite dominant and quite uh, freely uh, used and uh, quite often used. Controls also very important because they need to dim the accuracy of the levels uh, needs to be quite strong. There is intent, people attending that space, again, same as theater, are there uh, wanting to be there and experience what uh, you're about to offer. Some cases, more before, maybe a lot less now that things are getting a bit more um, interesting design-wise, it was a black box. Uh, quite a few gallery spaces um, still kind of follow the black box uh, rule. And they have a very interesting combination of audience on one end, because they're there to see something that is in display for them, but they are moving around as people do in architecture. 
So it's a very interesting combination that it becomes quite an immersive experience because it's almost the best end of both worlds. Architectural lighting design, exhibition lighting design, here's a few examples. It, it has gone really long way. There are some uh, unbelievable exhibitions coming up over the last couple of decades. Very interesting, um, really nicely done from a design standpoint, very well integrated and generating environments that are um, either very pleasant to be in or um, very educated and very exciting and very inspiring in, in many cases. And their, their use of both techniques. So uh, exhibition lighting is actually using the best of both worlds because they're using the miniature kind of aspect and detailing aspect that architectural lighting design has that theater maybe not so much. We're a bit more crude uh, in theater in our uh, detailing and approach. And also using all of the aesthetics and, and visual needs and desires of a theater stage. These are uh, stage sets basically. So it's a collection. It's almost like a promenade of a show, right? Funny enough, almost in full circle um, and having developed theater um, tricks and kind of uh, toolkit from um, a large scale. You uh, small scale, Maria Rosario. There we go, thank you. <laughs> um, it actually, and obviously with the rise of LEDs, which has uh, changed quite a few things, theater started kind of returning the favor in a sense, right? And looking into architecture to uh, see the opportunity of developing uh, further the techniques that are used in theater uh, even today. So theater also borrowed from architecture, I think three elements. Um, one is integrated lighting. It's something that started, it was always done in a way, but it was either too bulky or too crude, or it didn't really work, or it set the set on fire, or it caused a few problems. Now with LEDs and the scale that LEDs have, um, have come to, it makes integrating any kind of light element in any kind of set element or structure very, very easy. And also because LED controls have developed with DMX or DALI or wireless or Bluetooth or whichever technology you want to use, it is a technology that's also adaptable and compatible with um, the theater kind of technical aspects of things. So we're starting to see uh, more and more often shows that are using light as an actual object as well, be it uh, a graphical and an aesthetic object or an actual, what we call practical, right? So using lights to a light source as the light source that is, a floor lamp, a table lamp, uh, wall lights, uh, and so on and so forth. So self-illuminated sets is something that is becoming uh, very common because it's very easy to do now. Um, light also becomes an object, so it's a, a, an aesthetic, a design, almost a set element as well. Even in some kind of quirky cases, you can find them as, as wearables on stage. The second aspect, which for me is the most interesting one, um, I think it was finally the opportunity for a theater and theater lighting with it to escape the black box, kind of, you know, get rid of the rig and uh, not rely on it so heavily anymore and not needing to be contained in a black box of a conventional theater space. Um, Site-specific performances have been happening for quite a few decades. But um, at the beginning, they didn't involve any technical uh, support. So they were usually like uh, daytime promenades or uh, shows on the lawn or things like that. But now the, the whole immersiveness of theater is it's almost like they're stepping off stage. And um, actors are mixing with audience. Uh, it's an immersive and interactive experience. Their use of spaces it can be quite phenomenal. Um, and some shows then can find like really quirky spaces that have never been used that way. And there's quite a few examples. Venturing out towards the architectural world as well, which is a very nice crossover from one to the other. And they're starting to kind of meet more often than not. A few examples of that and a few kind of favorite examples, a very uh, well-known theater company called Punch Drunk. 
um, they have a touring show, they have a permanent show in New York, or I think they had up until recently. Uh, and effectively what they do, they take large buildings um, and design, build, and light from scratch, architectural spaces where the show is gonna develop. It's a theater show. Um, and it's usually a fairly kind of straightforward, what we call the classical uh, performance almost. The, um, the peculiarity about it is that it develops throughout a number of really highly detailed architectural spaces. So in those spaces, the lighting as well is architectural lighting. There are actually decorative fixtures, there are LED strips. So they are um, to the T architectural spaces and the actors move around and the audience moves around. They have a very uh, interesting kind of uh, experience to go through it. Audience can move around freely. So there are simultaneous shows that happen in various spaces at the same time. So every person going through that space basically has a slightly different version of the same show than the person next to them, depending on their choices. The, the interesting combination that they've done is that whenever they, anything that had to do with interior, and architectural spaces were dealt with with architectural lighting, obviously all of it fully controlled, right? Anything that had to do with outdoor environments, they were replicated basically and mimicked using uh, core theater uh, lighting techniques and fixtures. So it was a very interesting combination to see both worlds collaborating in one big, large architectural stage, basically. Another uh, kind of crossover example from the architectural side uh, this time is uh, Teatro Oficina, uh, Selena Bombardi uh, building, basically. And she designed and built a very architectural theater uh, within a, a fairly conventional space. Now, this might not look like a theater, so audience is sitting um, on all the uh, balconies and scaffolding can move around. It's quite a flexible space which means it can accommodate very peculiar and um, interesting and not unconventional performances. My favorite group, um, the, the kind of UK and London based uh, people who probably know them, they're called Shunt. Uh, it's uh, a performance and theater collective. And effecti effectively what they do, they also generate, they are the masters of tampering with uh, human perception, um, guiding people through the space without actually having a guide. So they generate these spaces and structures where you're inevitably and almost instinctively with the use of light quite heavily guided through uh, the whole process of the show, the, the journey of the show. And again, it develops in various different spaces. They're using a combination of architectural and theater fixtures, but it, it's more interesting their approach to how we respond to light. Like what does light require to do in order to uh, instinctively guide us towards one direction or another or generate a mood or have us gather or have us split up. So they were seriously tampering with kind of crowd manipulation uh, in a sense, but for the art's sake, so I guess we're good. Um, very quickly, uh, a show that we're uh, preparing at the moment, uh, which was quite interesting for me because it, I haven't in this particular one, so it's, it's a dance performance, but because it's a touring show and it's meant to be a pop-up, um, anything, any lighting, any, the entire set piece had to be uh, contained within itself. So it could be wrapped, travel, um, dismantled, uh, assembled, and so on and so forth. So um, it's called Space Cadet. Uh, and obviously the set, as you can see, resembles a satellite quite heavily, actually. Um, and the dancer is moving in all parts of the satellite, up until the dish, inside the box, onto the platforms, and so on and so forth. So that required um, some lighting that can, A, uh, be miniature to be integrated within that set, be robust enough, be IP rated, which is something that the theater is now getting equated with, what IP rating means for our outdoor shows or um, particular installations. And it was very interesting for me because there wasn't a single uh, theatrical fixture used. 
the entire um, installation was done with LED strips, uh, RGBW, using DMX drivers uh, with a small console um, from, and from the app as well, the console to program. The, even the small little spots was uh, an actual outdoor uh, little spotlight, like a surface mounted spotlight with Zoom. So it was very nice to see um, what I know quite well from architectural lighting work being fully implemented in theater without the use of, of the other. Um, and this is, and obviously a, quite an interesting um, kind of phenomenon, I would call it, uh, and I'm probably part of it as well, um, is people that have actually starting to move now from architectural lighting into theater lighting or into theater lighting as well, which is uh, basically uh, what I'm doing. Um, it's quite interesting because they're quite complementary, uh, but it's, and it's happening more and more kind of as we uh, move along. This crossover and borrowing and lending and it being inspired basically uh, by adjacent or other disciplines, obviously it's not just theater and uh, architectural lighting design many other uh, visual based and experience based uh, sectors have tapped into architectural uh, lighting techniques, theater lighting te techniques, the combination of both, again, using the best ends of both worlds. So fashion, for example, uh, a fashion show at the moment is a performance. It's not just um, uh, going down the catwalk anymore. It matters a lot for the brand, what the set is gonna be, what the lighting is gonna be, what the experience for the audience uh, will be, to the point that in some cases, the actual fashion is not really lit because it kind of uh, contradicts and tampers with the drama of the, the overall view. Oh, this is, they are speaking a lot. Okay, I think that they can leave the conversation now. Oh, don't leave. So, um, similarly, uh, and in an actual almost identical uh, manner, retail has picked up on that as well. Um, the last uh, couple of decades. So now you're seeing not just the window fronts, which were always a bit of a set uh, and theater kind of uh, surrounding, also the actual shops themselves. So the entire um, retail experience have been tailored to fascinate, to relax, to attract attention, to very goal, and to have this extra wow factor that actually brings back into um, the appreciation of the brand. Even automotive industry is kind of doing tricks, basically. So design and light has infiltrated uh, in quite a few sectors. Uh, and whether I like it or not, LEDs have a lot to do uh, with that crossover and that transition uh, to various other sectors, which also, on the other hand, gives us as lighting designers, be it theater or architecture, the opportunity to um, get the inspiration from literally wherever it can, and also apply what we do uh, wherever we think that it would be suitable and appropriate for. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Maria, you can speak now. Thanks, Anna. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. It's very, very dense um, and yeah, uh, full of uh, inspiration for us. Um, yeah, I really like like how you dissect the both theatrical uh, lighting and um, architectural lighting to understand where where the crossover can can happen between the disciplines. Uh, I think that also the examples were very tangible and thank you for, for also bringing your uh, personal projects um, to us. Uh, I would like to, um, to invite the, uh, the guests <laughs> um, to, to put down some questions, to ask some questions if they have. Uh, please yeah, put it down in the chat. 
Um, I already have a couple here. Can I stop sharing? Mm -hmm. okay. So we can see everybody's faces. Yes. Um, okay, so the first question is, uh, given your experience both in theater and uh, stage lighting and architectural lighting design, uh, can you tell us more about the synergy between the lighting designer, the scenographer and director when it comes to prepare a theater performance? Uh, are these professionals working closer together uh, than what it ha happens in architectural lighting between lighting designers, architect and interior designer, for example? What is your experience? Uh, how can we as, light, as architectural lighting designers bring more theatrical ideas at earlier stages? So um, the collaboration between uh, what we call in theater the creatives is, um, is obviously very close and it starts uh, a lot earlier than it does in, in architecture. Um, obviously in theater as well, there are the case that you would jump in last minute, but this is not the norm. Normally a production starts with the entire team in place. Uh, they all move in parallel. I've been, for example, for shows, I've sat in the early discussion of the dramaturgy and nothing to do with lighting, obviously, but it would help me get a much better understanding of what it is that we're trying to do so that I can bring that out with the lighting as well. The collaboration with the set designers, it is very close, which makes it really important that you actually like each other a lot more important than uh, architects, for example, which after the meeting, you can just kind of brush off and it's fine. Um, it gets a lot more personal in theater, which on one hand, um, it's very nice. It's for, for me personally, it's, it's a lot closer to uh, kind of my style, let's say. Um, on the other hand, it, it can get quite intense. And also bear in mind that you start the collaboration very similar to what, how we do it in architecture. So it's production meetings, everybody sitting around the table, every person kind of bringing the part, coordinating, planning, programming, and so on and so forth. And then it comes to the point where we're setting up and it can be from a week to four weeks of 24 seven. So you get into this bubble world that your people, your village, let's say, are the people in the production, whomever they may be the actors, the creatives, the technicians, the, the production, whomever. So it can get very emotional sometimes. We get withdrawals when we're done, for example, because it's quite intense for um, a period of time. This doesn't happen in architecture and it doesn't really need to happen in all fairness because the projects, the nature of the projects is different as well. It takes longer, it has more time to uh, sit, for example. Theater doesn't really have time, especially for the last uh, kind of production days. Uh, there is no time. You're running against the clock because also there is no option of not opening. There is a very heavy deadline, same as with the uh, exhibition, especially temporary, temporary exhibitions. There's a very fixed deadline that hell needs to break loose before that deadline moves which in architecture, we don't have that rigidity. I mean, we all have deadlines, but we know nobody's gonna die if we don't meet them, right? So there's a lot to be learned into how um, the, the creative, so the set designer, the director, sound designer, they're a lot more respectful of each other because they equally have the understanding that we all need the others in order for our part to show which is something that in, in a good case scenario in architectural lighting, you might have that. In a bad case scenario, you probably won't, right? There's a hierarchy that in theater doesn't really exist apart from the fact that the director has a lot of the final word and, and that's pretty much the only differentiation. Thank you, thank you. It was very, uh, yeah, illustrative and yeah, very, very interesting. I didn't know it uh, personally. So uh, I think, yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, next one. Um, yes, so um, immersive, immersive and experience-based aesthetics has become key in creating temporary installations like theater performances, exhibition design, fashion shows, and outdoor light festival. 
what is the role of time and duration in achieving the wow effect and how can we create the unexpected in a permanent light setting? So uh, time is uh, key, especially for those temporary um, and experience-based settings. It can, it can literally make or break uh, the whole effect if the timing is not right. There is a reason, for example, that in theater, you run the show again and again and again because the cue, the lighting cue and the sound cue similarly uh, needs to lead at exactly that point in order to work. A second later, it's going to fall short, it's going to fall into the, into the gap, basically. If it's not on the line of the actor or on the movement, it kills the suspension of disbelief, basically. You're trying to convince somebody of something that is not actually real. So any inconsistency to what you're saying or showing uh, is it's breaking the attempt uh, of actually convincing them. So that's transferring that into architecture, it's far more subtle, but it's just as important. We having, in architectural lighting, we have the opposite problem. We are far too abrupt sometimes. Well, in, there, in, in a lot of uh, cases and situations, the smallest thing, just a non off switch, should have a slow fade, a fade on and a fade off, for example. It does make a difference. It makes a difference when you're coming from you know, a nighttime outdoor condition, for example, from your parking or whatever that may be, and entering your house, the simplest um, kind of application, and all of a sudden you're, you know, in really bright conditions and you have no other option, no middle ground, no smoothness, no transition. So it is important. And in architectural lighting, what you're trying to do is most of the time do it as unnoticeably as possible. So the change is happening and instinctively you're, you're taking the person with you along that transition, but they don't know. It. They find themselves within the next condition, right? Because that's, that, and that's a welcoming uh, surprise. To, to do that, uh, on the other hand, obviously that requires, and, and it is, uh, case specific in both architecture and, and theater. So it depends what it is that you're trying to do. So if a, a surprise is what you're trying to do, obviously abruptness is important because you need it to be noticeable. If it's too smooth, nobody's going to notice it. There's, there's a few schemes, for example, especially in urban lighting, that in order to be discreet, and not annoy uh, anyone, they're almost too discreet and they go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the it, timing is key because there's a really fine balance that needs to be met for every single case scenario, depending on what it is that you're trying to achieve. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Sean. How do you balance lighting um, this in the space versus the people who will interact with the space? Is it always function over form or do you put in triggers to adapt the lighting to the visitor? Yeah, depending on the, if we're, let, let me be honest, wherever we're allowed, we will ditch function. I'm, I'm gonna be completely honest about this because I think the experience is far more important. Obviously not tramping over safety. Safety is a whole different subject, but function, clarity of function in many cases is overrated personally. So whenever we can, we get the, the opportunity to sway away from it and still have it be functional, but also be interesting or fun or stimulating or eye-catching or soothing, whatever that may be. So it is, any chance we get is the honest answer. Great, we like to be creative, nice. <laughs> Another um, question from Linus. Um, um, he says the intersection between the two disciplines uh, are inescapable, but it's wonderful to see the shared learning at so many levels between the two disciplines. Would you say LED has impacted the theater lighting in the same way it has impacted architecture? 
I, I think it definitely has uh, at a whole different level. Um, because again, as we were saying before, in architectural lighting, the principles have changed, partly because of the presence and the rise of LED. In theater lighting, the principle hasn't changed. It's just now they can do more. It can be far more exciting. It can be far more adaptive. It can be far more elaborate. And it's easy uh, to do. While um, in the older days, it, was, it wasn't impossible. There were always tricks. But if you see how they were done, they were always bulky and dysfunctional and couldn't always work. Or they only worked for some viewers or some points uh, in some case or some nights for that matter. Um, so there wasn't. It, the LEDs have freed up theater lighting completely to be uh, to be artists, basically. So not just designers, because you're now tampering uh, literally with the, the physical appearance of the stage. Or you could if you wanted to. So uh, the, the crossover is uh, fantastic. And I think because of LEDs and that being a very obvious common ground, uh, there, we, we talk to each other better now. It was it was a bit of a love and hate relationship? I don't know, uh, Kevin, if you're still on, he might correct me because um, he knows a lot more about this than I do. Uh, but my understanding always was that uh, they 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 treat each other as two very different worlds, and we're not that different one world from the other. And LEDs have helped create a common uh, lexicon in a way. OK, I think we have um, an, uh, yeah, another one, another question, uh, probably yeah, the last one. Uh, high contrast and use of colors appear to be through uh, eye catchers, both in indoor and outdoor settings. How can we employ these techniques uh, when we are requested to comply with various standards in terms of uh, light levels, uniformity, et cetera? Um, it's all, I mean, as far as uh, especially urban lighting is concerned, it, it's always been a very uh, tricky balance between what the number that it needs to be, basically, right, and the apparent brightness, so the effect that it's actually creating, which they don't always coincide. Um, there, there still are tricks in order to make something appear brighter, put something darker right next to it, which complies with regulations as well, because you're lighting either less or not at all in some cases. So th there are some basic principles, as long as we understand how it works. Um, so we everything is comparative. Obviously, that doesn't really help because everything is comparative when you're Facade, for example, is right next to somebody that's blasted the place for whatever reason. And, then, and now all of a sudden, this is your comparative measure, right? So how low do you really need to go uh, in order to still be competitive visually with uh, your surroundings? On the other hand, there are still tricks that you can create visual, visual gaps, basically, between your comparative. So you, you move your comparison. The, it, it, it is obviously case specific, but there are uh, things that can be done according to what's uh, what's desired. And then regulations, fine. I mean, to to an extreme, um, it depends what it is. I mean, there there are even cases that it might even worth arguing against them. If there is a valid point to be made, and it can be uh, documented and demonstrated. Um, then it's worth uh, doing. And if it's really um, in the favor of the final result, uh, it might be worth looking into uh, questioning regulations and standards, which is something that we should do more often than not. Not, not comply just for the sake of it, but question them on the list. Thanks. Yeah, that was very a nice uh, lesson <laughs> for us, so we'll remember. Um, if there are not uh, other questions, um, yeah, well, if, if you have other questions, please speak up. <laughs> if you want to ask directly Anna, 
um otherwise uh yeah we we close the um, the meeting here and uh yeah whenever you'll have further question you can email to uh to emma or to myself uh, and we'll send them to anna and she will be able to um, to reply um so yeah I, I would like to thank you once again and uh, all of you to for for joining so yeah, I hope you will be able to join next week um, to attend uh, Christopher Snowton's uh, talk about theater lighting more into controls uh, and um, yeah, more, it will be more of a technical, um, but fun uh, talk. It definitely will be fun with Chris, I can guarantee you. <laughs> Okay, thank you Thanks. to both the ILD and our lovely sponsors and everybody who attended um, tonight, because it's night here for me. So, yeah, good.